So Stranger Things 4 is completely finished, and I have a nearly insurmountable amount of thoughts. Most of them are positive, but I still have a lot to say overall. Major spoilers for all four seasons ahead, and there are timestamps in the description for those of you watching this video to see specific talking points. Stranger Things is a show that I have a very complicated relationship with. When the first season dropped in 2016, it had everyone and their mothers talking and binging. Being the same age as the main characters definitely added to a lot of the appeal of kids my age gorging themselves on the series. It was the first installment of the most recent revival of the 1980s Stephen King, Goonies, E.T. homages, which was great. Watching it today, not all aspects of the visuals or script have aged the best, but it is still incredibly charming and enjoyable. When season two was nearing release, I remember being very excited and then it actually came out. I watched the first episode and then for whatever reason just never finished it. When season three came out two years later, I was so far removed at that point that I never paid attention to it at all. With all of the delays that season four had faced, I was not excited for this season for a very long time. And most people I talked to weren't really either. It probably didn't help that the few bits of footage that were released of the season in the preceding weeks were of the worst scenes in the entire series, so that left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> However, something came over me in the month before its release, and I binged the first three seasons in like a week. Season one I already discussed. Season two was fun, but just felt like a more finely tuned, technically more well-made remake of season one, with one really shitty episode toward the end that even the creators of the show are desperate to forget about. And season three, I feel like I had the most fun watching overall due to the stylistic changes, but definitely had the most glaring issues in terms of character, pacing, structure, and script in comparison to the other seasons. Despite my concerns of viewership going down for season four, volume one of the season broke the all-time streaming record, logging over seven billion minutes of viewing time across America in just seven days, and it took the number one spot on Netflix in over 80 countries. After finally finishing all 13 hours of the unbelievably anticipated season, the biggest question is, did they stick the landing? Um, mostly. It's really, really good. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. We're gonna talk about volume one first, then move into volume two. I've seen volume one twice now, once when it first dropped, and once in the days preceding volume two's release. The first seven episodes of season four are a massive improvement in legitimately every way to previous seasons. The insane $30 million per episode budget was absolutely put to good use. First of all, the writing was drastically improved this season. The dialogue felt way more natural and it flowed really well most of the time. There were a couple moments like whenever Angela's on screen or that one it's up to us moment with Mike and Will on the bed that still have a ton of cringe, but the ratio of good to bad dialogue was a lot more positively skewed this time around. I think they did a great job in volume one of explaining the rules behind Elle's powers, why she can't use them, where they come from, what they can do, etc. Notice how I said volume one and not two, but we'll get to that later. A big issue I had with previous seasons, but in particular season three, was that Eleven for the most part was so overpowering most of the time that they only really used her when they wrote themselves into a corner and needed an easy way out. They would just have Millie Bobby Brown come in, scream a little, flex her left arm, get a bloody nose, and everyone lived happily ever after. In volume one, they spend a lot of time actually explaining the meaning behind her powers and where they come from, and that puts a lot of previous episodes into perspective. I am tired, however, of all her flashbacks just being to the same hospital room and screaming Papa 50 times before actually going anywhere. There was a lot of that in this season as well, but hopefully given the events of this season, we won't have too much more of that in season five. This season also did a very good job at visual storytelling. There are a lot of subtle hints to Vecna's identity and methods of killing hidden throughout the first few episodes that were really fun to catch on a second watch. There are a couple of exposition scenes with Vecna and Eleven that are very dumpy and explanatory in how they deliver a heaping dose of information that could have been improved a bit, but overall I was very impressed with how this season delivered the information to the audience. The effects overall were an exceptional improvement. The only moments where I felt there needed to be some touch-ups were a couple of the Vecna kills early on, the Russian wilderness that Joyce and Hopper are in, and when Henry is falling into the Upside Down at the end of Episode 7. When he was falling through that gray, yellow abyss, it kind of looked like a mid-2000s Zack Snyder film. Other than that, though, I thought the effects were outstanding. The practical effects for Vecna were some of the best I've seen in any piece of media, let alone TV, in a very long time. 
Many of the performances this season were so impeccable that it really highlighted the uselessness of a lot of the characters, in particular the California crew. These poor characters had absolutely zero involvement in the overall plot this season. Obviously, everyone is talking about how great Sadie Sink was, and yes, she was incredible. The Kate Bush scene is probably the best scene in the whole series. It is brilliantly edited, performed, and shot, all the way up until it's completely unnecessary cut to black, which we will get more into later. This video has almost as many plot points as the actual show. However, the standout performance this season for me was Caleb McLaughlin. He was absolutely phenomenal this season. Aside from Max, Lucas was by far the most interesting character. He seemed like he had a legitimate internal struggle that was constantly evolving and growing before a perfect final explosion of emotion in Volume 2. He was immaculate. I also loved Gaten Matarazzo. He had some wonderful moments this year too, particularly in Volume 2. The rest of the Hawkins crew and the Russia group all did a great job as well, but uh, let's go back to the California kids for a second. What happened with some of these guys? Charlie Heaton wasn't bad by any means, but his character has been legitimately useless since the end of Season 1, and he honestly felt like he was sleepwalking through a majority of this. There's a really weird subplot about him and Nancy going to college that leads absolutely nowhere, and the only real thing he does do is have a heartfelt conversation with Will at the end of the season. Noah Schnapp also gave a very mixed performance. He had some amazing moments and some very odd ones too, but Finn Wolfhard was honestly just kind of bad this year, and I really like Finn Wolfhard. As an actor and just a guy, he's super talented and charismatic. I loved him in previous seasons, I loved him in It. Don't blow your dad, you mullet wearing ass! And hell, even that shitty horror movie The Turning from a couple years ago I liked him in. He was just so underutilized here that he really stood out like a sore thumb in comparison to everybody else. He was the only actor here that I feel like the negatives of the performance outweighed the positives. These gripes I just discussed were really my only issues with Volume 1. Everything else I pretty much adored. Up until now, the show was, aside from a couple moments sprinkled throughout, for the most part, very family friendly. It was a fun show to watch with young kids to get them into fun action, drama, and horror television and films, but not enough to scar them for life. Also look, the kids in the show say shit and bitch a lot, isn't that funny? I'm a kid, and I say shit and bitch too, isn't that awesome? That's so relatable, they're just like me! Overpriced bullshit, son of a bitch, eat the shit! It was the perfect mix of fun and horror to hook families in. And then this season hit. This season is dark, violent, bloody, and genuinely disturbing at points. It is a major departure from previous seasons in the tonal department, which I absolutely loved. There's mass murder, dismemberment, blood, gore, and threat happening all around you constantly. Volume 1 raised the stakes more than any previous season to the point where it was the first time in the history of the show where I felt like nearly every character was in some degree of serious danger, which is a great way of keeping the audience hooked. If no one is safe, every moment, every decision, everything matters, and the audience will remain laser-focused to your story. Volume 1 did a great job at that. I loved how they, in turn with the tonal shift, relied on more mature 80s nostalgia. Up until now, it was a lot of Goonies, Back to the Future, E.T., flashy, neon-style homages to the time period, which worked really well for the previous seasons, but when this season upped the ante in the violence department, they switched over to more adult horror film homages from the 80s, which I thought was brilliant. I saw a lot of inspiration in particular from Carrie, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Silence of the Lambs. I mean, for God's sake, they got Robert Englund to play a role in one of the episodes. And he was talking to a character named Nancy the whole time he was on screen. My little nerd brain was so happy during that segment. Side note, as I'm recording this, I learned that Robert Englund's wife's name is also Nancy. Now that is some crazy shit. Regardless of any issues I have with the show, and there are many, you can clearly tell that the Duffer brothers love what they do and deeply, deeply care about this show. Perhaps I even fear a little bit too much. Volume 1 is also beautifully paced. Despite being nearly double the length of the entirety of previous seasons in the first seven episodes alone, it uses every single one of its 540 minutes to advance the story, reveal information, and raise the stakes all at the same time. Pacing was a big issue I had with seasons two and three in particular. The first two to three episodes of those seasons are very slow with not much happening, and once episode four hits, so much flies at you all at once that it can feel rushed. In volume one, every scene starts exactly when it should and ends exactly when it should. It reveals all the information it can give you without giving anything away, and every episode has at least one thing extremely significant to the overall story happen. We even have a legitimate body count by the end of the first episode, which was something you couldn't say for the previous seasons. None of Volume 1 felt stretched too thin or compressed too tightly. The finale as well was very well done. 
It concludes the first half of the season, leaving the audience with everything they need for the climax, the stakes have been raised, and the cliffhanger gives the perfect amount of tease to keep everyone intrigued. The end of the seventh episode left me on a real high, and the anticipation I felt for Volume 2 was the most palpable for anything new releasing in recent memory. And then I actually watched it. And listen, it is nowhere near bad by any means. In fact, it is quite exquisite, to be honest, for the first three and a half hours or so of the four-hour runtime before it sort of collapses under its own gargantuan weight. First of all, I loved everything about Episode 8. The only thing that still needed to be set up was Eleven and her powers being fully realized again, and they spent the perfect amount of time concluding that part of the story, as well as sneaking in a completed arc for Elle and her dynamic with Dr. Brenner. I thought it was a very smart subversion of expectations for Elle to not tell Brenner she understands what he put her through when he asks her to. Millie Bobby Brown's performance in this moment is my favorite from her this season. There is such a variety of emotions going on in that moment that all her facial expressions in a 10 second time span communicate more than words could in two minutes. It was a lovely, lovely moment. Matthew Modine as well did a fantastic job. His performance is one that I feel particularly inclined to not disregard because he is an actor that I have always felt quite bad for in all honesty. His remarkable performance in Full Metal Jacket should have gotten him a lot more high profile work than it did, and ever since then I feel like he got kind of screwed over in his placement in the industry. Also, the scene in the gun shop where everyone is riding into each other was so well directed. Now listen, is it cheesy that legitimately everyone in Hawkins important to the story is there at the same time? Yes. But was it intense? Also, yes, I loved what they were setting up for Jason and his crew, and that scene only raised my suspense for the final episode even more. I loved the way that the people of Hawkins finally felt like they had had enough and were ready to just completely pillage anyone they felt was involved in the murders. I loved how Jason was just a completely narcissistic, idiotic asshole that just happened to be really good at public speaking. I loved that Erica was getting more involved with the main crew. I loved how the episode ended with that epic cover of Separate Ways as everyone was phasing up to start the plan. It was the perfect Calm Before the Storm prologue. Everything was so well thought out. Nearly every single character was set up to potentially not make it out of the finale alive. Nobody felt safe. All four storylines were finally coming together. All the bases were loaded. The best batter on the team was up to bat, and all they had to do was hit the ball. I don't know if it's possible to overstate how legitimately on the edge of my seat I was when the finale began. I'm always a huge fan of when multiple storylines that were previously working independently from one another come together for a huge climax. You could feel the passion and the love for the series oozing out of the screen. The scene with Eddie playing the guitar on top of the RV looked absolutely gorgeous. The scenes with Max and Lucas in the house waiting for Vecna were incredibly well written and emotionally satisfying. Jason and his crew going after Erica made me the most anxious for a character I've been in a long time. The Russia crew trying to sneak back into the prison was really well thought out, although convenient that the Demogorgons already killed everyone in the prison, leaving it empty for our heroes. And the California crew was once again pretty boring. I was really hoping that they were going to make it back to Hawkins to fight with the rest of the group, but Elle's plan to help Max remotely was a somewhat cool idea, so I was able to go along with it. When Vecna finally showed up, that was when the intensity level reached its peak. It got to the point that while I was watching them cut back and forth to legitimately six or seven different climaxes, I started to worry about continuity a bit. For example, in the scene when Lucas and Jason are getting into this very well-directed, brutal fistfight, and Erica gets into the house, she runs upstairs and tries to open the locked door before it cuts away to something else. And it's about 15 minutes later before we cut back to that scene, and not a moment has passed by in that time span because of how much is happening at once. I loved everything that was happening though, so I was willing to give it a pass in the moment because for the most part, everything was proceeding perfectly from a story perspective. Vecna had L trapped, he was beginning to break Max's bones, Lucas was being choked to death in a corner, Steve, Robin, and Nancy were being choked by the vines, Eddie was being eaten alive by the bats, Hopper was about to be eaten by the Demogorgon, and it all seemed like they were going to lose hard, which would have been an outstanding choice. It was what they were building to this whole time. And then Eleven gets a really weird pep talk from Mike from beyond the dream realm and just decides she's strong again and throws Vecna at a wall, raises her arm, and screams like she always does. That moment felt annoying to me, but I was still on board because Eddie was just mortally wounded and was dying in Dustin's arms. That moment, I loved. Both of their performances were extremely well done, and I loved how they completed Eddie's arc as he died. It was very neat, and I'm glad there was a real consequence happening. Even if it was just another new character death that the Duffers could get rid of without killing any of the main characters off, which is just an issue the whole show has, not just this season. Also immediately following this, Max dies in Lucas's arms, giving what is next to the Kate Bush scene my favorite moment in the show. Caleb McLaughlin's performance in that moment should hand him the Emmy on a silver platter. It was absolutely heartbreaking. And then Hawkins literally splits into four pieces. I audibly yelled, holy shit, at the screen when Jason was ripped in half by that. 
that was such a cool visual. It all felt like something huge was about to go down. Regardless if they won or not, I was happy with where we were headed because either way, there were real, tangible, legitimate consequences. And then out of nowhere, Elle decides she has resurrection powers, revives Max by simply touching her, Steve, Nancy, and Robin kill Vecna with no problem, it cuts two days later, and everything is pretty much normal. There's a very bizarre editing choice that happens about six or seven times throughout this season that whenever something huge happens, they cut to black for like two or three seconds before coming back to the action. I don't know if the purpose of that was to fake out the audience like a cliffhanger or what, but it was very out of place every time they did it. And the two days later instance was the most jarring one. So many questions were left unanswered. How did everyone react to Max and Eddie? How did they get out of the Upside Down since Eddie cut the rope? If Max is alive now somehow, how is stuff still steeping through the Upside Down if Vecna's fourth kill is now suddenly void? It all felt so messy out of absolutely nowhere. What it felt like was the Duffer Brothers committed to killing off some main characters before they sat down to write the season, but then as they were writing it, they got darker and darker and darker to the point that they freaked themselves out and retconned the decisions they were planning on making without getting rid of any of the very well-placed foreshadowing, character arcs, and visual cues. The final 30 minutes of the last episode felt like it was from a completely different show, in all honesty. And not getting to see the characters deal with the immediate and honestly long-term consequences for even a second really left a sour taste in my mouth. It takes away a ton of the humanity and relatability from these characters. What is five more minutes of grieving in a two and a half hour episode going to do for the budget in the grand scheme of things? I did, however, really like seeing Hopper reunite with everyone. I thought it was presented very creatively. But then Will touches his neck, which has been his only real job for two seasons, and then everyone walks to the end of Hawkins, season on fire before a final cut to black. My friend told me that when the finale ended, he genuinely felt like he missed something. Like there was a 15 or 20 minute segment of the show that he fell asleep for or something. And that was a feeling I didn't know I was having too before he mentioned it. And it's true that it feels like there's a good chunk of the show missing. And the biggest reason for that is when you spend nearly 12 hours building to a huge explosion of tragedy and death and loss, and then it lasts barely five minutes before everything is magically fixed, you almost feel cheated. It wasn't poorly made on a technical level necessarily, but script wise, it went from near perfect to incomprehensible in such a quick time span that it felt legitimately disorienting. How can the first 95% of a season of television be so wonderfully done, and then the last five is so dangerously sloppy that it nearly kills it? Nevertheless, I did thoroughly enjoy this season overall, despite a few severe shortcomings in the finale. It's still my favorite season overall, and I was still at the very least intrigued by the final scene of the finale, and I'm excited to see where we end in season five. I just hope that in season five, we actually do get to see something fully different and fresh, as opposed to something that just masquerades as different for the majority of the runtime, before ending in the exact same way it always does. Do I think they dropped the ball on this season? Absolutely not. I think the Duffer Brothers and everyone involved should still be very proud of all the great work they did this season. They put up a valiant fight here and I really respect that. They had a lot to juggle here and I can empathize with that a lot as well. I just think that by the end of the valiant fight they did put up, they missed the final buzzer beater. I know that this was a mouthful just like the show, so if you stuck through till now, you are a real one. I wasn't planning on making this video until after I finished the show because I had way more thoughts on it than I thought I was going to. And what better way to get all those thoughts out there than making a video? Thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit me up on Twitter and Letterboxd. Let me know your thoughts on this monster-sized season down below, and I will catch you guys in the Upside Down. Chrissy, wake up! Hello. Time to wake up, time to wake up. Can you hear me? Wake up, Chrissy. Hello.